Hey there, my name is Christy. I'm the CEO and founder of DeSolo Life and a HoneyBook Pro. As a HoneyBook Pro, I've been able to see how so many different business owners are currently using HoneyBook and then what we're able to do to really streamline and optimize their accounts. That being said, there are so many common mistakes that we see as people are just getting started. And so I want to make this video to share those with you so maybe you can avoid those if you're just diving in. Or maybe Maybe you're not just diving in and you maybe have been using HoneyBook for six months, a year or two, and this video can just be enlightening to you and some simple tweaks that you can make to really enhance your setup. So with that, let's dive into the biggest HoneyBook mistakes that we see and what I wish I knew when getting started. <laughs> I'm so excited to go through this tutorial with you to show you the biggest HoneyBook mistakes that we see and for you to realize that they are actually super simple. And if you've made these in the past or you're just discovering these things, know that you are not alone because not only do we see this all the time, but I even did some of these same mistakes in the beginning. So let's go through them. The first thing is not integrating your email account. So if you come into your settings and then you go into company settings, click into integrations and then make sure your email is actually integrated here. If it is not, it's going to say mailman at honeybook.com. All you have to do is connect it here and go through your email provider. It takes less than 60 seconds to set up and then your emails, your brochures, everything are not going to be going to your clients as mailman at honeybook.com. It will actually be coming from you. The second mistake we see is in your preferences. Often we get messages from clients, from students, from people being like, I don't have automations turned on and my clients are getting these emails saying, Hey, I sent a file. Did you get it? Or maybe it's sending questionnaires or files to them that you are not sure where it's coming from. Well, this is actually coming from the preferences, the actions section. I would recommend turning all of these off to start unless you absolutely know you want to use these. So for example, send a questionnaire to my client three weeks before. This is a big one send a reminder to my client if they've not viewed my sent smart file or file within three days. That one is the one that people are like, it's sending reminders. I don't know where it's coming from. I didn't want that to go out. Send a smart file three weeks before or expire legacy proposals. So make sure you take a look at this action section and turn these off if you don't want them going out automatically. Okay, the third mistake we see is having multiple projects for one client. Now I wanna go through this a little bit, talking about adding a new project or new client, what the difference is, and when you should add multiple projects per client. So the mistake portion, right, is say you have a client who is a monthly recurring client who you send an invoice to each month. That should be one project, right? Every client you have is automatically gonna be one client, but you could add multiple projects. If you click add new project, right? And I say, okay, this is DeSilva Life, HoneyBook setup, or let's say HoneyBook monthly support. Then I'm gonna put the uh, other and then create project. Now I could add my client to this. Okay, so I added John Smith, and now this is our project portal. Now, once you have a project portal, you can send multiple files in here. So you'd click in files, you'd see everything that's here, whether it's multiple invoices, you can always create new, and just have this all in one place. If you're sending a new invoice to an ongoing client, you do not want to start a new project. You wanna go ahead and search for that portal that you already have and just create a new file in there. Now, when would you create a new project for an existing client? 
If you are doing a whole new service, a whole new project, for example, if we had a ClickUp roadmap that then moved into a custom ClickUp build, those would be two separate portals. If you're a photographer and you had a mini session with a family and then they book another mini session the following year, that would be a new project portal. So there are some simple rules that you should follow in terms of of, you know, creating new projects, but typically if it's an ongoing client, you just want to have one portal so that it, all the information stays in one place. Another quick tip for you here is that you saw that when I created this project, I renamed it. Well, when something comes in for from your contact form, it's just going to be that person's first and last name project. So Christy De Silva's project. I always recommend coming in here and renaming that project. I look like putting the client name or company name dash and whatever the service is, not only so that's how it shows in my pipeline and in my calendar, but also also because the client can see what the project is named. So it just makes it a little bit more clean, not only for you, but also for them. Okay, moving on, the next mistake we see is cluttering up your pipeline. So here, let's take a look at our pipeline, right? You could see we do have a good amount of stages. So inquiry, follow-up, three months, six month book call, on hold, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what we see is you can actually customize your pipeline, right? And add these custom stages. And you can see what we've added as custom stages. But what we see often is sometimes people are trying to use these stages as like task reminders. So edit gallery, send gift, send onboarding questionnaire, where for those things you really want to utilize instead project tasks. That way you have those reminders in your task section, but they're not cluttering up your pipeline. And typically people forget to move people in their project pipeline stage quite often. So let me pop back into John Smith's project. And here you could see if I want to add a task that says order client gift as a reminder, I can just add task, click order client gift, and then put a due date on it. And it's as easy as that. All right, we have three more common mistakes I wanna go through. So the next one is editing templates in the template center for a client. So what I mean by this is if I come into tools, my templates, people will come into here and be like, okay, cool. I'm going to come into this proposal or actually let me go into one of my templates. I'm going to come into this invoice template that I have. And in here, I'm going to put a custom package for someone that maybe is like, okay, 45 minute strategy session, boom, 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 boom. And then click update template, use template, and then attach it to a project. But what your templates really are for are for you to have this base blank slate to work off of. And what you want to do instead is go into the project portal first, and then you want to click create new invoice then go ahead and open that invoice and then edit it from there. That way, now you can see this invoice template is attached to John Smith's project. Anything that I edit in here will not affect the original template. So you're keeping the templates super clean and then anything that you need to customize for the client, you could do so now that it's attached to their project. While we're in here, the next things that we see often are there are so many buttons to click, so many settings, so people don't usually realize that you can change change the button for your files and the thumbnails for your smart files. So if you go ahead and come into configure settings, this right here, this thumbnail is going to be defaulted to whatever that template from the template center was or a default template that was already in your account. So all you want to do is click on this pencil and you can upload a new photo or choose from your library. That way it's customized to you and your brand.
The next thing is that button. This is actually in the three dots here. These settings in, hold on, let me go back to the template center because I actually can't do this in John Smith's project. Again, changing the thumbnail, you wanna make sure you do that in the template center so it's a lasting change. So if I come in to a template, now let's go into say this style guide. Then if I come into the three dots and click edit email settings, I can choose an email template that I always want to bring up if I'm sending this manually. And then this button here, if this was a style guide, instead of it saying get started in the email, I want it to say style guide. And then you can click save and it will change that button text. Okay, and my last tip for you, but certainly not least, is uh, one of the most common mistakes we see is people not embedding their contact form on their website. So when you create a HoneyBook contact form in the template section, you could have multiple contact forms or just one generic one. Then you can see when I click in here and I click publish, it's going to give me this embed code. So you can click on these embedding instructions here or if you have your um, web hosting platform logo here, you can check on that exact guide. But you're gonna copy this code and then embed it on your website so you can see for De Silva Life, this is our HoneyBook contact form super branded and looks like it's a part of our website, but this means that we are not losing one single lead that inquires through our website. We don't have to be sifting through our email because maybe we had like a Squarespace or a Webflow form, but instead they're going to go right into HoneyBook and then this can also trigger the amazing automations that are possible through HoneyBook. So that is it for our biggest HoneyBook mistakes. I hope that was helpful for you and you learned something new. Let me know in the comments if you did learn something new and what was the most eye-opening for you. So I hope that video was helpful for you and just learning the different mistakes that we see and how you could really avoid those when getting started with HoneyBook or even fix them now to streamline your account moving forward. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and go ahead and subscribe to our channels if you want to stay in the loop about all the HoneyBook tutorials coming down the pipeline. And if you are ready to dive right in to everything you need to set up your HoneyBook from the beginning, we also have a HoneyBook course. I'll make sure to drop the link in the description below if you're interested in checking it out. And do me a favor and drop in the comments below what your biggest takeaway was from this video. With that, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.